dictionary definition of music is the art of arranging sounds in time through the elements of melody, harmony, rhythm, and timbre. Low Pass Filter is a show about the nature of this thing we call music, how it functions in people's lives, how it's contextualized by society, and why we find certain music meaningful. This is Low Pass Filter. Filter. Hello and welcome to Low Pass Filter. This is a show where we talk about music and what it means in our lives. Uh, my name is Matteo Noche and as always I'm here with Band and Wayne. What's up, man? Hey, man. Happy good. Monday. Yeah, good to see you. <laughs> Happy post-holiday. Yeah, we're in t- uh, 2023. Yeah. Which brings up that this is our 13th show. Wow. Lucky 13. That's cool. Uh, I, I knew it had been around a year. Yeah, I th- believe we started in December of 21. Yeah. And then we wow. went all through uh, 22. I think we just we kind of missed one month there. Yeah. Um, and then uh, now we're on, on our our second year of this show. Yeah, if if nothing uh, proves how fast time is moving now, at least for us in in this stage of our life, seems to just be it's just zip by. by. But it's been fun. Yeah, I've been and having continues a good time, to be fun. I'm still uh, very appreciative to to be part of the show with you. Yeah, it'd be kind of boring if it were just me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch. It would, it, would, it, would, it, would, it would be really boring, actually. We want to get right down oh, to man. it. So, as we do uh, each and every month, we switch back and forth between topics. Um, this month, it happens to be my month for the topic. And uh, so, the title of the show is So You Want to Be a DJ, which a lot of people seem to want to be. A lot of people want to be DJs. Yeah. yeah. We are DJs. We are. Yes, we yeah. are. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I think you got a lot more history in being a DJ than I do. Yeah, po- possibly. But, uh, you know, how much how much is enough and how much is good? <laughs> you know, the first 10 years of my DJing pretty much sucked. So I, I, <laughs> I don't want to, you know, we don't count that. But well, you got you to gotta get experience. That's right. You know? It only took 10 years to get <laughs> off the suckage. <laughs> no. But eventually... Eventually, I feel like I got there. But uh, we kind of both approach this topic in a, little, a couple of different ways. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of looked at the history of uh, DJs and, uh, you know, uh, radio DJs, uh, because that's kind of sort of where it all started off. And you kind of looked at uh, uh, as at the turntablist, as yeah. uh, which is a, yeah. a logical extension of that. Kind of an art form uh, that... that came out of spinning records. Yeah. And so as we do, uh, before we start this, these conversations, let's define terms. So uh, the term uh, disc jockey was coin- coined by Walter Winchell. I've heard that name. He was a uh, radio commentator, gossip commentator, uh, notorious uh, at times. Uh, but he, he coined that phrase in 1935. Um, and it, re- it originally meant uh, referred to phonograph records. Some of you might have encountered those in, in your travels. Um, and was used to describe radio personalities who d- introduced them on air, playing recorded music for dancing and parties, uh, rose with the mass marketing of home phonographs uh, in, the ni- in the late 19th century, it says here, but uh, that would have been like, you know, yeah, you know, roll around tubes and yeah, the, the uh, tin boxes fitted with weird old, equipment, the you old know, clay cylinders and stuff, and yeah, stuff like that. Uh, and then, so sometimes credited as the very first uh, disc jockey was this guy named Jimmy Seville, okay, who was a, a, a British, um, well, DJ. Uh, he was a British personality. And he did his first live dance party in 1993 using a single turntable and a makeshift sound system for in, a uh, live, not a radio audience, but like a group of people. Yeah. What year was that? 
1943. And then four years later, he put two turntables together uh, and started uh, DJing uh, using that. Um, and then in 1947, after the war, uh, the Whiskey A Go Go, not the one that uh, we might be familiar with on the Sunset Strip, but the one in Paris, which was actually wow. credited as the very first discotheque, okay. started having people come in and spin records as opposed as opposed to having like a stage band or, yeah. or something yeah. like that. Uh, then into the 50s, um, you had a lot of uh, clubs in Germany. Uh, that really catered to servicemen, uh, U.S. servicemen, um, a guy named Klaus, I'm going to murder this, Kurinery, wow. uh, later known as DJ Heinrich, Wow. Uh, made comments and uh, conducted audience games and announced songs uh, while playing records. And uh, then in your uh, late 60s and early 70s, of course, DJ, radio DJing was, was maturing and growing up in this country and around the world. Uh, but to your, uh, your uh, premise for this, um, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, you had a Jamaican sound system culture. Yeah. Yep. So you had uh, producers and DJs like uh, Ken Tubby and Lee Scratch Perry, yeah. um, who kind of became these turntable artists. Yeah, yeah. And uh, also taking the uh, disc jockey broadcasting out of the studio and into open spaces right. as well. Um, uh, mobile sound systems uh, were a big thing that inspired what uh, created American hip hop culture. Um. Yeah. So I kind of looked at mine as the impact of DJs, individual DJs, on music itself yeah. and what we listen to. Yeah. And so uh, I started off with um, all my, you know, my notes are all kerflui, so I've kind of <laughs> lost some of that. But I started off with um, uh, Dick Bondi, who okay. was uh, a, the guy who first started spinning the Beatles. Wow. And yeah. uh, so in 1961, he played the song, Please Please Me. Uh, nobody over on this side of the pond uh, had uh, any idea who these, uh, these four lads were. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. he kind of introduced that music uh, to him. Sometimes, like a lot of people, was referred to as the fifth Beatle. Uh, you know, there's probably 10 or 12. Yeah, there's fifth multiple Beatles. fifth Beatle. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, then you had guys like Alan Freed. Mm -hmm. who uh, kind of broke the color barrier. So, you know, we've talked about this on the show before, about race records. Yeah. Um, and really, uh, you know, uh, the black America's music was consigned to something called race records. Um, they weren't out in the front of Woolworths. You, you know, you yeah. had to go to a, a gas station or a fireworks stand. They had them in the back, you know, and stuff like that if you wanted to hear you know, John Lee Hooker, or, yeah. uh, whatever, you, yeah. you, you know, you had to, uh, you had to really look for him, but he was the, the guy that uh, uh, crossed the color line and started playing, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, these, these black artists alongside white artists. Yeah, um, which was really important to exposing that to mainstream American culture. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, he got kind of caught up in a, what they call the payola scandal, okay. which yeah. was uh, payola is uh, when you pay for play, you, yeah. you yeah. slip somebody uh, you know, a bag of cocaine or some cash or something, yeah. some yeah. Benjamins, uh, to play your song. Put this on the air. Yeah. Uh, and I've got a story about that myself, but I'll, I'll, we'll work around to that. And then uh, finally, I just wanted, before we broaden it out I, I, off of radio type DJs, I wanted to mention two stations that uh, in the Los Angeles area that were totally formative, not just for me personally, my music taste, but also for the world's taste. Yeah. Uh, uh, the first one was KNAC. Okay. And the second was, one was KROQ. Yeah. Yeah. Who basically broke bands like uh, the Go Go's, the Plimsolls, the Bangles, Oingo Boingo, the Blasters, Walla Voodoo, X, Berlin, 
the B-52s, New Order, Depeche Mode, and The Cure, nobody yeah. was listening yeah. to that kind of music when they, uh, were, when they brought that kind of music yeah. out. Yeah, and that would have been uh, Rodney on the Rock, pretty right. responsible for a yeah, lot of that. Yeah, Rodney right? Bingenheimer. Yeah. Um, but you also had people like Richard Blade, uh, Freddie Sh uh, Snakeskin, Jed the Fish, and the Poor Man. <laughs> Um, Rodney Bingenheimer, of course, uh, hugely influential, influential and kind of oily uh, uh, figure. Uh, they made a movie about him not too long ago. Uh, yeah, a little while back, a documentary about his career. And yeah. A little bit tragic. I forget what it was called. I didn't see it. But uh, I actually knew the guy, yeah. so I didn't, you know, I, I guess I should probably... Something with Sonny in the title or something like that. Um, Kind of a tragic story in a way. Yeah. His 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 arc kind of went up and then went down and was kind of left with with nothing in a way. They, he uh, I don't know if this is an apocryphal story, but they, they, it is said that Crosby, Stills, and Nash were formed in his living room. Huh. Uh, and that that you know he brought he brought numerous people together. Yeah. Um, he was kind of um, what you might term a scenester. Yes. Yeah. Well, he could be found in tiny nailers on the strip, holding forth from his booth, uh, usually with a couple of teenage girls, flanked by a couple of teenage girls. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my, my interaction with him was um, a, a band that I was in, because I, I, I worked in Hollywood in the early 80s. I, I was a recording engineer, and I was on the strip. And... Um, all this music that we're talking about, um, you know, was like the soundtrack for my employment in Hollywood, basically. Uh, um, I can remember, like, going home from a, from a session at, like, 8 in the morning and listening to uh, Never Say Never by Romeo Void and, nice. or U2 or uh, yeah. all these other bands uh, that, you know, just literally filled the air of Hollywood at the time. But... Um, uh, a group of musicians that I was in, we recorded a cover song of uh, of Little uh, Pretty Woman, okay. the Roy yeah. Orbison uh -huh. tune, and uh, we thought we had you know reinvented the wheel with that. We had uh, <laughs> the, the we had a female singer, chick singer in in the band, and so there was kind of a gender bending kind of yeah. uh, thing uh, going on there, and it was very. Uh, synth driven and all that kind of stuff, and so it kind of fit into the Berlin mode, and, yeah, yeah, um, and that sort of missing persons and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, it, as the, in the course of my employment, uh, we used to get tickets to the Grammys because our uh, our boss uh, Larry Dunlap was a was a uh, I don't know if they're what they're called board members or he was a you know one of the muckety mucks in the Grammy organization. So we all got tickets to uh, to to the Grammys, which was you know a pretty cool thing to have. Yeah. So I actually traded my ticket to the Grammys to Rodney Bingenheimer <laughs> to play our version of Pretty Woman. What was that payola you that were is, talking about? That is payola. <laughs> that just just there's no there's no getting around that, and so. This turned out to be the most one of the most infamous Grammy broadcasts uh, ever to happen. It was the Rick, it was the Rick James okay okay uh, 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 super freak uh, Grammys as they called it, and it was just like a sort of cocaine blizzard of yeah. <laughs> uh, of uh, you know pop stars and partying and wild debauchery and uh, you know that sort of thing. And I traded away my yeah. ticket to this, this Grammy show uh, <laughs> to uh, Rodney Bingenheimer uh, to play. Uh, uh, get one. We got one yeah, single play. Got one. <laughs> I caught the last two minutes of it. I went over to a friend of mine's house, and they're like, "Come in, come in! They're playing your song," you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. So it was uh, sort of a borderline thrill, I guess. But yeah. in, in 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 the grand scheme of things, it really. It really didn't do do a whole lot for our careers as a band, but uh, right, but still worth it. Thereby right? hangs a tale. Still, yeah, that's a great story, man. It's still worth it, I I think you know. Yeah, I I guess I guess so. Dude. It was really my only shot to ever go to a Grammy uh, awards <laughs> thing, so because uh, I wasn't working there the the next year, but oh, uh, man. Um, but you know. 
you got to take a shot sometimes. Yeah, that's, absolutely. You know, yeah. that's cool, man. <laughs> well, uh, I was thinking, wasn't um, the Johnny Otis show a big broadcast out of L.A.? Yeah, in the sixties uh, and early. Real 70s? Don Steele was the was one of the a guy uh, on KHJ, um, which was a big fifty thousand watt flamethrower. Yeah, um, did. Uh, this, they, him and a couple other guys invented this thing called Boss Radio, huh. which was uh, a top 40 format that actually spread out, again, uh, L.A. influenced the rest of the country, spread out across the country. Yeah. So you had Boss Radio, yeah. uh, radio stations everywhere. Um, and then I guess we can't talk about DJs without talking about Wolfman Jack. Yeah, he's, he's on my list because he was still relevant when I was young, and, yeah. and that's definitely one of the first radio personalities that I was aware of. And he really became a celebrity yeah. radio personality. Absolutely. I think the movie American Graffiti really yeah. put him on everybody's, yeah. Uh, yeah. and anybody who that wasn't in, in that broadcast area of uh, KERF AM, uh, which you talk about flamethrowers, uh, this is a radio station that was located in the Texas border region and broadcast a quarter of a million watts. Wow. Which basically covered most of the northern hemisphere. Man. But yeah. uh, Robert Weston Smith was his real name. Uh, he died in 1995. But uh, he, they just, um, he got hired and they just basically dropped him out at the transmitter you know, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and he did his show from there. Um, eventually, he uh, they moved the station uh, to uh, Rosarito Beach, which is in Baja, California, just not far over wow. the, okay. uh, the Mexican border. Yeah, I was thinking there was a, a south of the border connection there. Oh, yeah. Um, and he developed such a kind of wild signature personality on air. Right. Um, he also cut some records. Yes, he did. Some quasi-legitimate, quasi-novelty kind of records. Um, probably is, is one of the kind of proto-shock jock kind of DJs. Yeah. Not that he was trying to be shocking, but I would think, you know, he would have been influential on DJs who kind of went in that direction. He looks relatively tame, I'd say, from our, our perspective in 2023. Yeah. But uh, what then? So, what was the name of the song that you had? Uh... I just found something that was. Um, where did, uh, now I don't see it on my. It got mixed in. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> oh, here it is. Uh, it was just a something on Spotify. Wolfman from the Sunset Strip. Okay. And it had some recording of him on air. Because that's what eventually happened. He moved out of Mexico. He was tired of being down there and yeah. away from the action. And they got him an office on Sunset Boulevard. Okay. And he started recording his shows there. Yeah. Um, I had, of course, uh, the uh, Clap for the Wolfman by uh, the Guess Who. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. I actually have a couple Wolfman Jack records, and they're, they're not bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> kind so of what a, kind of a thing are they? Are they they're like... Um, Kind of uh, R and B, okay. kind of kind of R and B rock and roll, kind of pop. <laughs> and is he actually singing, or is he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Not greatly, but but uh, one of the two that I have is actually a, a pretty solid record. Huh. <laughs> well, he probably has some of the best players playing yeah. behind him, yeah. so that, yeah. that always helps. <laughs> well, uh, believe it or not. We're up to our first break. Sure. How did that yeah. happen? It was just me blabbing. See, that's how it happened. <laughs> I just blabbed through the first 20 minutes. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with more Low Pass Filter in just a moment. Thank you. 
the Low Pass Filter. We're talking about DJs today. All kinds of DJs. There's radio DJs, there's club DJs, and there are yeah. turntablists. Indeed. As usual, we, we could have a three-hour episode, really. You know, um, it's hard to unpack all this stuff in a short amount of time. But, but uh, yeah, so we're talking about the original DJs, disc jockeys, people who brought popular music of the day to the masses. Um, you mentioned in the, the previous segment uh, the Jamaican scene yeah. where uh, you know you had um, people manipulating recordings, um, taking that into venues, then you uh, had this sort of mobile DJ culture, um, right. block party culture, yeah. and it was um, a big deal to have the largest mobile sound system and um, then you also had something that went along with that which was called toasting yes. so you kind of separated the personality on the microphone from the person spinning the records and had more of a team effort which allowed the person with the records to to get busier doing mixing and and um, and really focusing on uh, kind of uh, playing a continuous mix of music for the dance party and then the, the toaster would be somebody getting on the mic and kind of, uh, you know, um, kind of accentuate, hyping up the crowd and, and, and that sort of thing. And that directly uh, resulted in, in Cool Herc, who immigrated to the United States and uh, in the Bronx started doing the same kind of thing and he's really credited with um, extending the breaks of records by having double copies of each record mm -hmm. and being able to cross back and forth between the two records and, and keep that segment of the song that was considered the break or that instrumental dance beat po portion of it and uh, that directly led to the art of DJing as most people know it today mm -hmm. which is interesting because uh, it no longer means disc jockey, really. Right. DJ, the two letters. No in discs of them. involved, folks. <laughs> well, nowadays you don't have to. Um, but I was thinking about how DJ is no longer an acronym. It's in and of itself something. Right. A DJ is just a DJ, whatever that means in, in terms of uh, creating something out of uh, pre-recorded music. Right. Creating a, a dance groove or remixing it into something else. And, and so, you know, from Jamaica direct to Brooklyn, yo, uh, you know, this kind of also uh, grew out of these block parties, these the street parties that you're talking about, where essentially the DJs would hotwire a street lamp yeah, to yeah. power their rig, you yeah. know. And they would have, you know, a couple hundred people or more, yeah. uh, you know, out dancing in the streets. And of course, they would be toasting over the records and, uh, you know, yeah. boasting, toasting and boasting, yeah. if you will. Yeah, yeah. In in American culture, there was, uh, you know, that what they called playing the dozens. Right. And so, if you kind of mix Jamaican toasting and that, and and, and this sort of more primitive form of of uh, rhyming, mm -hmm. you get the original American. Uh, MCs, as they were called before, they were refer referred to as rappers. Mm -hmm. They were MCs, which is just like DJ. MC comes from Master of Ceremonies. Yep. Um, of course, they kind of would flip that to like mic controller. Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, so, uh, oh, I was going to say the 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 movie Beat Street that came out in 1984, uh, which was probably five, six, seven years after this culture really started to, to grow. Um, they kind of reference what you're talking about where um, a bunch of young people would, would find like an abandoned building or something and, and tap into the power lines that were still active and, and set up their gear and, and, and uh, have underground parties you, like you that. You get the rave culture out of that. Yeah, indeed, indeed, that would be another 10, 10 years or so later, um, essentially the same kind of thing, yeah, underground, underground dance parties. Um, so yeah, I approached 
the concept of what is a DJ, kind of from that point of the original hip hop DJs and turntablists that started with Cool Herc and then uh, Grand Wizard Theodore and Grandmaster Flash. Mm -hmm. And of course, Grandmaster Flash is the most well known um, for creating uh, creating beds of music for uh, making rap records or hip hop records um, by by mixing uh, with multiple records, juggling between records, cutting, scratching, as they referred to uh, the manipulation of those records to create kind of um, improvisational dynamics. Yeah. And uh, and then in my Spotify playlist, you'll see from there kind of examples of how that evolved over over time. Yeah, Run DMC. Yeah, Jam Master J. Um, with, Beasties, the Beastie Boys. Yeah, LL Cool J had Cut Creator. Run DMC had Jam Master J. And, and um, so those were the DJs behind the rappers who were creating the the musical uh, bed in the studio, but then live they they could recreate that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, something interesting in that is is they would have to have records pressed of sampled music that they created or music they created based on samples. Um, to be able to play live to recreate the music that they had created in the studio, right? Um, and so that's kind of an interesting note in the process of of uh, making music that way. Um, it basically meant you didn't have to have a band anymore, right? Um, like uh, in a Public Enemy line, he says, um, uh, "Run DMC." Uh, said a DJ could be a band. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a huge aspect of the hip hop culture. Well, I just know, you know, having been a performer when all that was happening, how, uh, you know, you went from clubs that had, you know, bands that would come in and play top 40 or yeah. know, occasionally, depending on the <clears throat> club originals and, and that sort of thing, went from live music to DJs almost overnight. <laughs> and to say that uh, musicians were a little on the resentful side uh, yeah. would be underestimating. Yeah. Uh, but they were essentially replaced by, you know, yeah. uh, turntablists. Yeah. Kind of similar to the way some musicians felt about um, synthesizers, computers, yes. um, uh, electronic drum kits. My grandfather was a drummer, and, and when I was a little kid, I remember him you know, I don't think it was uh, extremely dire to him, but he did feel like this is, you know, they're trying to replace drummers. Yeah. They don't need a drummer anymore because they got a programmable drum machine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for me it was, it was kind of like, yeah, but this is cool too. You know, I, I, well, in, in my musical <laughs> career, uh, I was in a band, uh, we couldn't keep a drummer. So it was like the Spinal Tap, uh, spontaneously yeah, combusting yeah. drummers. So eventually we just said, you know, well, let's just get an emulator and, and forget <laughs> about forget about live drumming, you know. And yeah. we actually performed with the, with the drum machine, uh, you know, in that formation. And not all, not the whole time, but but uh, yeah. quite a bit of the time, because we just couldn't keep up, couldn't keep yeah, up. Yeah, what are you going to do, man? Yeah. <laughs> But then that creates its own effect in itself. And, yes. And, you know. Uh, it's its own sound. If you're open-minded, you can appreciate both sides of it. Uh, I love drummers, by the way. They're, I love live drumming. It's just like, oh, yeah. especially good ones. Um, <laughs> I was lucky enough to work uh, with a number of really great drummers in my recording career and just observe how, you know, how much they brought to, you know, songs oh, and, yeah. and service of the song that you you don't necessarily get out of a drum machine. No, I think you could s suggest that uh, a, a band can only be as good as their drummer in a way. Yeah. You know, you could be making some really cool sounds and if you have a drummer that can't keep time or isn't interesting or can't play to the song. I've been in a couple of those bands too. <laughs> 
<laughs> I've been that drummer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. But yeah, so uh, you know, the, the 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 logical extension of of doing the turntable uh, uh, manipulation, of course, became sampling. Yeah. So when the technology caught up to uh, caught the car, if you will, uh, the dog that caught the car. Uh, you know, then you had uh, machines that could do this sort of thing. And so we start to leave discs, we start to leave the yeah. physical media realm. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where we're at today. I, I mean, I don't really know, I don't spend a lot of time in clubs, but I know people who do. And, uh, you know, uh, it just it appears to me that mostly these uh, folks are playing off of files, computer files and yeah, and um, uh, even before that, um, in the 90s, the MPC uh, sampler, mm -hmm. a device that had a series Akai, of, yeah. yeah, a device that had a series of buttons that you could record a sample into, mm -hmm. could record a bar or even maybe 16 bars, and um, each time you press one of those pads, it's going to play that sample but you can also uh, um, use it percussively. So mm -hmm. you can play the whole sample or you can get the, the downbeat hit um, at the right, start Right, that's where you it. get things like string hits. Yes, you know, yeah. That's like a, a, it's kind of a 80s thing now, but it was big for a while there where they would take the first note of you know, of an orchestra, yeah, and yeah. they would just it would punctuate yeah. things with the orchestral or yeah. orchestral hit, you know. Yeah, and uh, so so then you have DJing without the actual discs, um, and and then able to either play live with that sampler or use it in in composing on a computer, mm -hmm. or maybe to to tape at one point, but um, I was thinking about a good example of, of a DJ who was no longer playing discs um, um, would be the RZA from the Wu-Tang Clan. Mm -hmm. um, all of that stuff was, was done on a computer, but he was a record digger, right. as we call, you know, someone who obsessively looks for samples on records. Yes. And um, so he was using that modern technology in the early 90s to find all the samples, load them into the, the equipment, and then compose digitally from there. And um, still considered well, like, a well, DJ. We've mentioned on this show uh, Clyde Stubblefield, uh, the funky drummer. The most sampled drummer most of all sample time. drummer has been showed up in so many different, oh, yeah. so many different songs. Yeah. Uh, was sort of rampant at the time, uh, and I don't yeah. think he really, <laughs> he didn't really get his due, I don't think, on that, but... Uh, yeah, only the people deep into it. Now, yeah. You know. And then, of course, uh, then you ran into legal situations. Uh, there was kind of a wide open period there yeah. in the early 90s when you could take the samples, and then, yeah. I don't know, the Copyright Act, the Sonny Bono uh, Copyright Act uh, yeah. kind of uh, swept that all away. So then you get your diggers, your people who were, you know, yeah. looking for stuff kind of had to find a different way or pay for it. Yeah. I don't think we think about it as much anymore. It's still a bit part of the lexicon of, uh, of you know, hip-hop music, electronic music, um, that, that sampling is, is still a legal issue. Mm -hmm. But in the late 80s, early 90s, like, the effect that sampling by DJs had on the music business in terms of, of uh, you know, uh, legality and financial impact and stuff. Like, it was huge. It created this big ripple effect in, in how the art of that music was being made. And, and then also the ability for any artist to appears in someone else's work um, to to go after their own rightful uh, compensation for that and and you know so then you get entities that are j solely exist to watchdog where music is being played and sampled and 
Yeah. See our show, Who Owns Music? Right. Yes, we, we have discussed that. We discussed that, yeah. that in length. Yeah, so it's a lot of, a lot of stuff uh, in that, coming out of that evolution of hip-hop DJs and then into um, uh, also the, the uh, techno and house and rave culture as well. Um, that was kind of the next uh, evolution of, of live DJing. Mm -hmm. Um, I put one example in there by uh, Juan Atkins, who during the hip hop era uh, was known as Cybertron and had a big hit called Clear. But he eventually, uh, or shortly thereafter, um, pretty much the, the main pioneer of Detroit techno music. Okay. And, and um, yeah. Well, believe it or not, uh, we're running up against our second break. Uh, it just doesn't seem fair, does it, folks? But uh, each minute has 60 seconds in it, and we, we just, there's just no way of getting around that. <laughs> so we're going to take another quick break, and we'll be back with a more low-pass filter in just a minute. Filter, Matea Noche here, Ben and Wayne here, discussing as we always do music uh, in its many shapes and permutations. Um, we should mention that our Spotify playlists uh, are in uh, the uh, description below. You can see what was on our mind uh, musically yeah. as we discuss this topic. Uh, most of mine are just kind of referential uh, songs that. Um, that uh, reference DJs. Yeah, and, that's what I got from your list for the most part, yeah. Um, songs that, that kind of, um, yeah, give give uh, reverence to the DJ or kind of nostalgically refer to a time of... When they were important. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Which I don't, I'm not sure they are anymore. Well, they are or they aren't, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, both myself and Bandon are DJs. Yeah. Um, I have been involved in uh, public radio for a very long time. I had a show, a long time show on KHSU called Alternative Therapy. It was yeah. probably 19 years into that show, which is kind of crazy. You had it going for that long? Yeah. Wow. Wow. And then before that, though, I back in the, the, the Jurassic period, I, when I was going to college, I was on college radio. Rio Hondo, uh, KRHC, yeah. uh, which was uh, what they called the carrier current uh, radio station, which meant that it didn't actually get past the parking lot. Wow. So that was, yeah, so that was more like the um, student station kind it of It was thing. exactly that. Yeah. It was yeah. a student. Yeah, you broadcast in, within the, the campus. Right, and if you were in the uh, in the dining hall, you, you, yeah. you got it so yeah. lovely. But that's a very important thing. Um, uh, which hopefully still exists today. I think, you know, um, uh, a lot of universities probably still have that, and it's a way to entertain the students, also probably deliver some information, um, but also give a foundational um, start uh, to students you know, who may be interested in broadcasting or it's an media absolute, fields. Yeah, it's absolutely a training ground uh, here in Humboldt County, up at Cal Poly Humboldt. We have something called KRFH, yeah. which is a great radio station. It's yeah. really good. Uh, student run. Uh, Cliff Berkowitz, I think, is their advisor. Oh, okay. And uh, they do a really good job. They, you know, they do some great music shows, some interesting public affairs stuff. Yeah. Um, so they're an LPFM, and just like KZZH here at Access Humboldt. Um, 
and yeah, it's a place for them to cut their teeth, uh, as if you will, on on you know, being on the air. Yeah, yeah, and um, maybe not uh, as much of a focus. But I was I was actually talking with someone a couple of days ago about if more young people were encouraged to to try that, spend a little time going through um, some kind of broadcast training, you know, um, even just a little bit, you know, maybe a semester or two or something. Um, uh, that can help build some confidence that can, can uh, be useful throughout your life. Um, and I was kind of reflecting on how I wish I had a little bit more encouragement towards that when I was young because um, even in terms of doing something like this, speaking to people um, here through the camera, but but uh, say you're in a situation where you need to talk to a crowd, mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, I did not have a strong sense of, of being able to do that for up until recently. <laughs> well, interestingly <laughs> enough, the apple didn't fall too far from the tree in your case well, because your your dad was a DJ here in Humboldt County. He was, and um, and he did actually have me on air a few times as a kid. Nice. Um, we uh, he he developed uh, uh, some skits that we would do. Uh -huh. That uh, and I was a little, I guess, a little precocious at the time, but but still, um, the idea of public speaking was was very nerve wracking to me. Yeah. And and I was just uh, in this conversation I was having, I was kind of reflecting on how important learning to public speak can be. Yeah. Um, and and you know. So anyway, well, it's definitely go, it's a class in. that you should take. I, 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 yeah. I don't I, think they, not sure they have them in high schools, but they definitely have them in college. And I uh, uh, availed myself of a public speaking class, and it was a really great experience because I kind of had the same sort of stage frighty yeah. sort of thing, even though at the time I had played in bands and, and I had a huge amount of stage fright, <laughs> you know, especially yeah. when I first started playing in bands. I was, I, you know. And I won't go, won't go down that road, but uh, after the public speaking uh, class that I took, it really kind of, you know, opened me up and, yeah. and you know, learned how to talk to a crowd, you know, and, yeah. and or the thousands of people that might be on your microphone if you're sure. on a radio station. Yeah. And maybe even on a, on a deeper level, just have a bit more sense of self-confidence, you know? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So, not to get too off on a tangent there, but yeah, I, I think um, um, college radio uh, is, is a good, uh, um, important uh, thing to, to keep around. I hope it keeps on going. And then as you were talking about some of your early radio days or, or uh, the 19 years you had here with your, your show, I mean, essentially you were kind of carrying forward the, the college radio paradigm. Right which, um, uh, you know, kind of going back to the early days of DJing before the evolution of turntablism and, and the art of spinning records and stuff, um, delivering music to people is, it's, it's an important cultural thing. And you kind of quipped that, does it still exist anymore? And it does. Yeah. It's just, um, you know, kind of uh, in different spaces or it fills a different niche um, depending on, on the circumstance. Um, so, you know, we have um, satellite radio, that's still mm -hmm. a big thing. And there are certainly commercial radio stations all over the country. And oh, yeah. There are people that rely on listening to them, particularly driving in their cars. Well, we have an embarrassment of riches here in Humboldt County because we have a number of great radio stations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, Unfortunately, you know, uh, KHSU, where I kind of cut my teeth, has is, is been uh, destroyed, if you will, by the university. Uh, yeah. It turned into a mere shadow of itself, but yeah. I won't go down yeah. that road. But when I first started <laughs> going there, it was very much had the college radio vibe. Yeah. It started off as, as their college radio station, eventually uh, morphed into a sort of a hybrid NPR station, right. but they yeah. still had room for people to come on, members of the community, really, yeah. to come on and play music for the community. And yeah. uh, it was a training ground, and I was they, I was allowed to make mistakes. I was allowed to, uh, you know, do some really terrible, uh, what I used to call, uh, "Why does a dog lick itself?" Radio. <laughs> 
because it can, uh, you know. Uh, right. Uh, and uh. that was invaluable, really, in my career, uh, playing playing radio. But I was also going back before that and before college and all that stuff, kind of thing. I was the kid that came to the party with the records, uh, so I would have either records and later cassette tapes or whatever, yeah. and eventually uh, CDs that would show up and pro kind of program the music whether they wanted me to or not. Yeah. You know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that leads into, um, you know, both of us having experience DJing, spinning records for people, playing music for other people, um, and putting that into the context of today with, with um, digital technology, streaming technology, um, streaming uh, audio services like Spotify, which we use to present our playlists. Um, there are still plenty of people who want music in their life. They want a, a, at some point during the day to have a stream of music, mm -hmm. but they may not have the wherewithal to seek it out on a platform like Spotify or collect records. Um, and so there still is some reliance upon the selector, which is what I refer to myself as mm -hmm. uh, in terms of being a DJ. I'm a selector DJ. Um, it's not about remixing. It's not about creating a new um, sound out of it. It's just honoring the music. But there is an art to it. There is, if you're a, a, what we might call a music nerd or a music head who, who loves to discover a lot of music and collect a lot of music and curate a selection, um, there's an art to knowing what your audience wants to hear yeah. or knowing when you can present something to them that you might think they might not know this or they might not be expecting to hear this right now. Yeah. And um, thankfully, for in terms of what I do and, and what you still are, are um, connected to, there's uh, a real joy in knowing that there's people that want, want to... To yeah, have you there. absolutely. And you know, one of the things that took me a long time to figure out was was a sh having doing shows that have a flow to them. You know, yeah, that have yeah. kind of a logical mm -hmm. progression. Yeah. Um, and I got, I kind of got to the point, and this is, you know, just completely subconscious, where I would do an entire show and all the songs would be in the same key. <laughs> you know. Well, I would but, not be surprised that you would have the ear for that too. I, you yeah. know, I didn't do it consciously. It just like, this song is in the same key as yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're right about that. I, I mean, I do a show down at K-Mud um, and, uh, you know, I get calls from people who are super appreciative. You know, they're just like, I mean, yeah. we're so glad you're there and I really look yeah. to what you're playing and thanks for doing it yeah. and stuff like that. And that's kind of what keeps me going back to it. Yeah, um, is that you know, and I, I know that you in your uh, uh, your show that you do on Twitch. I'm on Twitch. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you you have fans from all over the world, basically. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that, I I, uh, I won't say tune in. I would be a little embarrassed to log say on, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, uh, Makes me feel silly to say I have fans, but um, no, they're but absolutely fans. They, it's, you know? it's quite incredible. Somebody really. who comes back to your show more than once is a fan. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's quite incredible. It's, it's kind of an emergent uh, thing with this platform um, uh, because it is part radio, but there's a visual component, and then there's also a real-time interaction with the listeners through the the chat, and then. Um, I speak to them through the microphone. I read their chatting, mm -hmm. and then I respond to them. And um, they're from all over the world. Some of them are in my time zone, but others will be, you know, uh, 10 a.m., 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. while I'm on it at the wee hours of the morning. And um, uh, yeah, it's incredible to be able to, to reach people uh, all over like that. But but the the thing that's the the most rewarding is is how they show a, a real genuine appreciation for you being there and entertaining them with with music and 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 then because it is that um, that connection on this platform um, where they can can all see each other's chat and 
it it becomes a, a active live community situation. Yeah, which is which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I you know I go through these things where <clears throat> I know people down at, at my station. You know, they just come in with their computer and they they play out their Spotify playlist. Oh yeah, yeah. And so my not that not what they're playing isn't terrific, which it is. You know, it's just like is that cheating? I, is it's, that yeah? I mean, it's a form of curation. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I I'm not going to judge how anyone does it if they're. I just don't know how to judge it. I'm not yeah. judging it. I just yeah. don't. I just look at that, and it's yeah. it's foreign to me because I'm an old dude, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it, like I, I, it's all physical media. I'll like take that back. I'm lying. I will throw in something <laughs> like if I if I need something from like YouTube or something. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I will throw that in there. But and even though I'm predominantly vinyl, I do that. But as is well. that cheating too? I don't know. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I I. I generally tend to hide the fact that I'm doing that, and mm. and uh, I am like you know 99.9% .9 vinyl. Mm. But occasionally, I know somebody wants to hear a song, or there's a song that I really want to put in the mix, and I just don't have it. Um, and the way my setup is, um, they can't easily tell that I'm plugging in my phone, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and so you know sometimes I'll sneak in a YouTube track. The other night, I had to explain to somebody that I was sneaking in a YouTube track. They were like, they were like, uh, were they disappointed? No, but I, but, <laughs> I, but I, I felt it required an explanation. Ah. Like, I do this every once in a while. Just right. to, you know. I don't make a habit out of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you come in with your Spotify playlist and you're on on the air, um, you know, you're curating uh, uh, oh, a soundtrack absolutely. of music for people. Yeah. Um, you know, as DJs, we kind of like the idea of being a little bit more um, active in, in, you know, um, at least using two sources and going back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, because it does feel like you could just hit play on your playlist and walk away. Um, but for radio, you're not being seen. Could be a late night programmer or something, and you know. Yeah, you're still entertaining people with yeah. the, with the choices that. Yeah, you made. yeah, and a lot of radio stations. Uh, throughout history would have times when there was no live DJ Absolutely. once computers came in or in fact, I automated own, machines. I own a box full of reel-to-reel uh, -reel tapes from a radio station. I'm not sure it's a local one, but it has all the back announcing and, yeah, and everything yeah. in it. And, you know, they could put that on and and it's a fairly, it's a, played at the lowest speed, so it would run for like three or four hours. Yeah, yeah. You could do an entire yeah. show and... and Without human interaction, so it's not, it's not a new thing. They could have, <clears throat> they could have two or three real players that could be automated into sequential play. Yeah, um, that would go maybe for the next eight, ten hours, and then you remember the big machine that that held like thirty carts or something. Yes, and and that would be on an automation rotation to plug in a commercial every so often. And so that was the old way of automating radio with no DJ there. Nothing new uh, under the sun, folks. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're just about out of time. This is just whip this show is just whip right by like yeah. they have a tendency yeah. to do. But any closing thoughts about about DJs in well, the twenty uh, twentieth century or the twenty first century? I guess I would just say I, I hope that um, they continue to be relevant and that in some way are, are still a necessary component in turning people on to music and entertaining people who, who uh, would rather have someone else provide the programming for them and, and just, you know, being part of a cultural thing that's still, still relevant today. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, um, you know, just coming from a time when, uh, you know, I may have mentioned this before, but, you know, when I was a teenager, you could, you know, we we would go out and cruise the boulevard in that American graffiti sort yeah. of style, uh, which predates American graffiti, by the way. But anyway, uh, you you would pull up at a stoplight and you would everybody would be on the same radio station. Yeah, yeah. They'd all be listening to the same thing. So there's that kind of collective experience that I think is kind of diminished now, but 
It still happens. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about community. <clears throat> and I think it still happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, and hopefully it will continue to have uh, a life. Um, you know, not everybody grooves on the same thing, so. That's true. So, you know. I you know, always, uh, just kind of my closing comment, like when I'm playing something, somebody will call up and say, man, you're having a great show, you know, it's gonna, you're playing great stuff, and I, and I said, well, thanks, but I'm about to screw it up somehow. <laughs> I'm sure I'll play something that you're gonna absolutely hate in the next, in the next five minutes or so. But. But that's kind of the thing, you know, so it's like if you want to program your own music, I guess you'd go to Spotify. Yeah, yeah. But some people really do like having someone else provide that for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, you know, you're doing other things, you're working, you're, yeah, you know, you're, yeah. you're and hammering on. Whatever. Hopefully you enjoy the uh, discovery or the sense of, of um, you know, kind of uh, subverting your expectation. Yeah. You know, you don't know what's coming next, and then, oh, this is delightful. That's right. <laughs> this is what I wanted to hear right now. Yeah, you betcha. <laughs> all right, well, that's about all the time we have for this show. Uh, as always, uh, you can find our Spotify playlists. We didn't really talk much about them a little bit uh, this time uh, in in the description uh, doodly-doo below. And, um, you know, Bandit, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all you folks for listening and or watching. Yeah. Low Pass Filter. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching Low Pass Filter. at lowpassfilter2020 at gmail.com. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified about future shows.